know, um, and then also talk about Landlord Tenant Act and um, how it pertains to you. Uh, there's responsibilities for you as the agent, responsibilities for the owners, and also responsibilities for the tenant. Um, I'm not going to read you every bit of the Landlord Tenant Act law. Um, you guys are educated. You guys can read that on yourself. But I'm going to hit some of the highlight points that I think um, would benefit you guys in, in being out here dealing with property management uh, type stuff. So what is mold? Uh, mold's not a plant. It's not an animal. It's a living organism. Um, and its sole job in life is to decompose organic matter. Um, if we didn't have mold, we'd be swimming around in leaves right now because mold breaks down the leaves and, and turns it into dirt. Um, plays a very important role, and in, in, in we mold can be used in, in a positive way, but also mold has a lot of negative uh, attributes for it as well. So mold multiplies or grows by producing uh, microscopic spores. Um, very, very small in nature. And when you're talking about the size of a spore, if you took a human hair and divided it into about a thousand pieces of diameter, um, that's about the size of a mold spore. So when we look at a picture like this, we're looking at billions and billions of mold spores. Um, you know, the, the, roughly you, on the tip of the pen, you could probably put about 10,000 mold spores. I mean, that's how small the, of the product that we're talking about. The number of mold spores in the air, we're, we're always going to have mold. We're breathing mold right now, okay? Um, we'll never have a mold-free, clean environment. Even things such as um, hospitals, operating rooms, uh, clean rooms for computer development facilities, they always have mold in the air. And, and they have the world's best air filtration systems. They still have mold in the air because as soon as you open the door, the mold comes in with you. Um, so mold spores... Um, are going to, in the, in the indoor air environment, are going to differ from day to day, um, season to season. And so there's really no set um, government uh, guideline as to what an acceptable level of mold is. So when we do mold testing, we usually take an air sample on the outside and then an air sample in the, an area that we have a concern about, and we compare the differences. Most spores, like I said, cannot be eliminated. Um, we're always going to have them in our, in our indoor air environments. So let's talk a little bit about common misconceptions about mold. Um, this mold did not come from the beer, even though I'm sure mold was used uh, in, in the process. I get this one all the time, black mold. Black mold, toxic mold, it's the only, it's, everybody wants to know, is it black mold? Um, that, that, that's the number one question. Black mold is not the only type of mold that we need to be worried about. Um, black mold is really not even a type. Um, it's just a, a phrase that somebody has coined and, and to describe it, and it actually describes a whole bunch of different types of molds. Um, but according to CDC and the EPA, all molds have the potential of at least being allergenic. So if, you, if you're allergic to certain types of mold, and you have to look at mold as no different than um, if you're affected by pine trees and you're affected by oak trees, when pine's in session, you're invisible, you're perfectly fine. Molds are the same way. There's millions of different types of mold. Just because you're allergic to mold doesn't mean you're allergic to every million types of mold. Um, I know that I can walk into a room that's filled with um, penask and I just, my throat hurts and I start to lose my voice, my nose starts to water, my eyes itch. You put me in that same room of Stachyphosphorus chartum, which is the black mold that everybody talks about, and I'm perfectly fine. It doesn't bother me at all. So, um, at a minimum, mold can be an allergen, and it's going to affect different people different ways. Bleach. How many people? Come on. I know everybody's probably put bleach on mold, right? Interesting thing, bleach will not kill mold on porous surfaces, uh, porous building material. Duke University actually did a study that when you put bleach on um, drywall that's covered in mold, it will actually amplify or increase mold growth. Um, the reason being is bleach, 6% by volume, the active ingredient is sodium hypochlorite. Um, and that does not allow, the ionic structure doesn't allow it to penetrate into the drywall and kill the root of the mold. Um, however, the other 94% of bleach is water. Um, and that or of course will penetrate down into the drywall and actually feed the mold growth. So putting bleach on your uh, mold growth 
isn't going to uh, help your situation. And what you'll find is landlord tenant acted can actually uh, put you guys at risk at, uh, from a liability standpoint. The other number one, or I guess that's number two, bleach is number one. Kills doesn't do anything. Kills is nothing more than a stain blocker. Um, and it says right on the, on the label, kills is a stain blocker. It's there to cover up water stains so that you can paint over top of it and the stain doesn't bleed through. It doesn't kill the mold, it doesn't encapsulate the mold, it just covers it up. Once again, increasing your liability. You're killing us here. I, I, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't make the rules. <laughs> Covering up can lead to costly litigation. Wow. Um, the other type of mold that I hear all the time is, oh, that's just common crawlspace mold. I've yet to see my lab report come back with common crawlspace mold as the type of mold that I find. Um, so, a little bit about crawl spaces. Roughly 35% of the air in your home comes from your crawl space. Um, so when you have mold in your crawl space, guess what? You have mold in the, in the living space as well. Um, now, it may not be amplified up to a point that it's, it's grossly impacting indoor air quality, but it is something that should be dealt with. When you have HVAC running through your crawl space, which is very common in this area, um, that 35% number actually jumps up drastically because your HVAC ducts typically leak air out, but in addition to leaking air out, they pull air in from your crawl space through a venturi process and pulling all that more, more moist, mold-laden air into your house. So what do we need for mold growth? We need three things. We need to have mold spores. We already talked about them, they're, they're in the air we're breathing right now, so that we're not going to get rid of those. You need to have a food source, um, and in this case we have some drywall um, from a uh, washing machine vent that had overflowed. Um, mm. Mold has to have an organic surface to grow on. Um, something that's dead, that was once living, it has to have that so that it can feed off of. And then lastly, it needs moisture. So of those three, the only one that we can really <coughs> do anything about this is moisture. And if we can control the moisture in a home, then we can control the mold growth because we'll never eliminate the food source and we'll never eliminate the fact that there's mold spores in the house. Building materials, like I said, wood, paper from the drywall, um, leather sofas, there's a, just a lot of organic surfaces for mold to grow on, um, cotton clothing. And if we can control the moisture source, like I said, we can control the mold growth. Common sources of uh, moisture leaks, obviously the, the big ones, plumbing leaks, um, roof leaks, those, those are, the, are the very common ones that you think about every day. This is a apartment complex in Yorktown. Um, this is the bathroom, which you can see right in the very corner is the bathroom vent fan. Um, the problem was that the bathroom vent fan was disconnected. Um, mm. We tell people all the time, bathroom vent fans are not for the toilet. Bathroom vent fans are for the shower. And so in a property management situation, in, in, in our properties that, that we, uh, we have um, actually gone away from having a, a separate switch for the bathroom vent fan and put them on so that when the light comes on, the fan comes on. Uh, we don't give our tenants an option. Uh, this is caused because the bathroom vent fan was not working. The tenant uh, never notified property management. Um, what happened is they typically like this like the, when I came in, I think the house was 66 degrees inside the house, really, really cold. Um, however, he liked to take really, really long hot showers. And so the moisture from the shower came up, condensated. Um, that was the moisture source. You can actually see the condensation was actually so bad that it was running down the wall um, and carrying some mold with it. So a little bit more um, of a not so common one in that picture where, where it's actually mold pulling air or pulling moisture out of the air because there's so much humidity in the air. Now, could that have been avoided had the walls have been like a latex? Or I mean, obviously something's porous to allow that to grow on it, correct? It's not just growing on a... Great question. Okay, so latex obviously is a plastic. Um, it's not an organic surface. However, um, a majority of paint, what's in paint, is uh, a clay, where, where they get the, cut, the, the ability to cover pigment. is it's a clay pigment that's inside it, okay? Um, in addition to that is we can get a microfilm layer of dust and debris that you just don't even see, okay. um, and then the mold will start to grow off that as well. 
Um, so in some cases, especially in bathrooms where you have a, um, like a semi-gloss or a gloss paint, it might be something that actually could be cleaned, even though that would go against some standards. Um, because in this case, the moisture source originated from the interior of the room, I don't have to worry about mold on the back side of the drywall. Um, but that would be one of those things that we want to look at on a case-by-case on -case basis. So as I said before, EPA and CDC both listed mold as, um, at a minimum, allergenic. Uh, inhalate, you can, you can get mold sequences not only from inhaling, but also from touching it uh, through dermal contact. And this last one, mold does not have to be alive to, to cause an allergic reaction. This is real important when we start talking about crawl spaces because I'm sure most of you guys have dealt with uh, property sale. Um, termite inspector goes in and finds mold in the crawl space or wood destroying fungus or fun fungal right. infection or however the, they want to word it. Um, and they go in and they spray Timbor uh, or Borate or mm -hmm. some sort of termite killing product. I won't take anything away. It will absolutely kill the mold. It will protect your investment and keep it from destroying the home. Um, the problem is, is from a health standpoint, mold, regardless whether it's dead, live, actively growing, dormant, um, it's still going to have the proteins at the cellular level that causes the immune response in the body. So simply killing mold um, isn't going to alleviate if you have a tenant or a, you know, a home sale where you're going to have somebody that has mold allergies that is being affected by it, it's not going to alleviate it just by killing it. So it has to be physically removed um, through a remediation process. Mycotoxins. Uh, mold produce, some molds produce what's called mycotoxins, um, and they're toxigenic. Um, and the best way that I've found to describe it is that everybody, everybody knows Hatfield and McCoys, right? They were fighting over land, and they were shooting at each other. They each wanted to cover, take over the mountain. Well, mold spores, or more mold colonies, do the same thing. They want the next mold spore or mold colony's land, and so they shoot mycotoxins back to try to kill the other mold so they can take over their land. The problem is, is that they're toxigenic to us, um, meaning that they have much farther, greater reaching um, health hazards associated with them. Some of them are carcinogen uh, carcinogenic, meaning that they can cause uh, cancer. Um, so not every type of mold is going to produce mycotoxins. Um, Stachybotrys chartum, which is the black mold that everybody talks about, it definitely produces mycotoxins that are carcinogenic in nature, which is one of the long-term effects that people worry about. And, and why black mold has uh, all the stigma that it does. Talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, color of mold doesn't really matter. Um, I've seen yellow, orange, gray, green, white, black, just about every color. Purple, um, draw um, behind some wallpaper the other day uh, that was carcinogenic. Um, so color really doesn't matter. It, this is not an indication of severity of, of mold. Um, not all mold that is black in color is stachybotrys. Um, there's a lot of different types of molds that are black. Doesn't really mean that it's, it's the stachy mold that everybody talks about. Um, and down here, uh, stachy is not a specific type as I, as I talked about before. So moisture control is the key. Um, control the moisture, control the mold growth. Uh, there's no way to control the, the mold spores. There's no way to control the, the building materials that are going in. Uh, if we have a watering event, a, a toilet overflows, a sink overflows, something like that, um, everybody recommends 48 hours to start a drying process. Uh, that means um, a company coming in, extracting water, setting up fans and drying, just because you run your hand across the carpet and it feels dry doesn't mean that there's not water trapped underneath the pad or um, at the subfloor level. So drying thoroughly is, is the key. Watch for condensation parts. Um, get ready to go into winter. Uh, one of the things that we have a problem with uh, now is that old windows, uh, we have a nice warm house in the, in the uh, winter time and you have a cold window and you get a condensation point on the inside and so you'll get um, if this is my window on the bottom of the sill you start to get some mold growth because it condensates and the water runs down once again 
the key there is replacing the window and getting something that's energy efficient. Unfortunately, single pane, old school windows, just that's what they're going to do. Um, Maintaining indoor humidity uh, in the winter time is usually not a problem because the humidity outside is going to be lower anyways because the winter is usually a dry winter around here. Uh, in the summertime, it's not uh, it's not typical of us to not have uh, relative humidity is over 75% outside, and so when that air comes inside, we need to to get the humidity levels down. Air conditioning helps with that. Um, yeah, that's what I was trying to think if that's what the, the case was. Um, so when we start getting relative humidities over 60%, uh, 55, 60%, there's enough moisture in the air for mold to start growing. It doesn't have to have a toilet leak or an overflow or something of that nature. There's enough moisture for the, for the mold to, to pull it right out of the air and start to grow. And that was the case with, with your property. So, talk a little bit about mold remediation. Uh, this is mold remediation in a nutshell. Um, this is a apartment complex, a condo above it had a leak. Um, this is a vacant unit that was actually for sale um, at the time that uh, an agent came in to show the house and walked in and found a moldy mess for somebody else. Uh, but the unit upstairs had overflowed, um, soaking this unit and you have mold growth down the bottom, mold growth in the ceiling. This is the HVAC closet that's behind that wall. Um, and had more growth inside. So a couple things that we do as, as a contractor, the first thing we do is we set up critical barriers, um, plastic to, to contain and define our work area, um, controls, prevents mold from, from leaving that area. Uh, the next thing that we do is run HEPA filters that are designed to capture mold spores. So we're filtering the air and it actually puts that environment into a negative, meaning that we're drawing air from other rooms into that room so the mold can't escape and go into another room and ultimately affect another room. Um, in the case of drywall, every recommending agency lists it as porous building materials and by definition it's not something we can clean so we have to throw it out. In this case we cut out all the drywall um, in the bathroom, the laundry room, and in this hallway. Um, What's left is the framing, which is considered semi-porous. All that can be cleaned through a cleaning process of sanding, scrubbing, HEPA vacuuming, and chemical treatment. What about an antimicrobial solution? I've heard of these before. Can yes. Um, and and that's, that's one of the things that we use is, is antimicrobial treatments. Um, we, once again, drywall, no. Um, but once we get rid of the drywall, this was all... What if it was like a kitchen cabinet or something? Kitchen like cabinet, that? yes. yes. Um, just wood, not drywall? Just, just not porous building materials. Now, when we get into kitchen cabinets, um, one of the areas that we start to have problems with is sometimes the boxes that they're actually made of, not the, the front of right. them, but the actual box, mm -hmm. um, and especially in kitchen sinks. Um, the, um, they're particle board. They're mm -hmm. cheap particle board cabinets. And in that case, particle board is considered semi-porous and, and that would be cut out. Um, but faces of cabinets, um, one of the things we run in, especially in foreclosed homes that are vacant and they're not maintaining power in the buildings, um, humidity levels spike and on the front doors of uh, the front faces of all the cabinets, you'll get mold growth because there's just dirt and grime and stuff from, from being a kitchen cabinet. Um, those are, are something that we can definitely clean, uh, but usually when we start getting into the boxes, especially if it's part of the board, um, it's going to have to come out. <laughs> what I would tell you and I tell everybody, mold and water do not get better with time. No. Um, it's something that it, it, if we can catch it in a small enough situation, it's definitely cheaper than letting it build and grow into a much bigger situation. Um, and um, when done right, um, I can tell you my fees for, for mitigation are much cheaper than um, your fees for litigation. So, um, Point taken. Yeah. Uh, and then once we're all done, we do uh, mold sampling to validate what we've actually done, and that's actually done through an independent lab. We take the samples, send them to the laboratory, uh, and they do analysis for us. And that's the same lab that if we come out and do an inspection, um, that we would use as well.
Now this may be a dumb question, but what once you've remediated it, say the cause was the HVAC, um, would you still send it to the laboratory to analyze? Or we do. Um, we are not required by the state. We recommend um, doing it um, just because we're cleaning something that you can't see. Right. And so when you're cleaning something that small, we can clean it very well, but we might be leaving trace elements behind. So we want to do some sampling to, to validate our cleaning processes. Oh, okay. um, so, and especially when you have landlord tenant situations, um, when you're talking you know, legality, Right. They want the black and white. And I can speculate all day long how great of a company we are and how great of a remediation we did. But when we take a sample and, and, and send that to a third party laboratory, that's the black and white analytical data that attorneys and, and judges like to see. Okay. So um, it's just another layer of protection to, to protect you guys. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about property management law. Why should you care about mold? Well, that's kind of your job. Um, yeah. But you know, you want to protect uh, your, yourself and, and protect your owners from further, you know, whether it's losing a, a tenant uh, or, you know, worst case scenario, the, the litigation that, that goes along with, um, with mold lawsuits. How many of you guys realize that Virginia Ten Landlord Tenant Act doesn't apply to every rental property in the state of Virginia? Um, there are very specific requirements for now, what I found after doing a lot of these classes with realtors is that most realty companies go under the auspice of it's there, although we don't fall under it, it's a good idea to follow the rules of landlord tenant. Um, and I can't, I don't know what what your guys' position on on it is, but um, we're going to go over some landlord tenant act stuff because um, I think it's it's good information and good reasons to, to follow it. So 55, 248.4, um, professional standards. Uh, this means you can't hire basically Joe Blow handyman company to, to do a mold remediation. Um, they're recommending that, um, or they're, they're saying you need to use a, a company that's going to follow one of the established guidelines, whether it's EPA, HUD, IRCRC, um, I think, or, or an industrial hygienist's uh, recommendations. Um, now, you can hire a handyman if he's going to follow those recommendations, but um, most of the handyman businesses or drywall you know, refurbishing companies um, aren't following those types of, of those standards. Um, basically what they don't want is that if you have this whole wall covered in mold, they don't want the drywall company coming out, ripping it out, and creating a larger mold problem and just putting some drywall back up. They want a standard to hold the, the remediation company or the contractor um, accountable to. You guys are responsible to, to maintain the premises in such conditions to prevent mold growth. Um, so that means if the tenant is having a problem, it needs to be addressed. Um, and that if you're not addressing those moisture intrusion issues, um, then there's a liability there. Just as landlord tenant act holds you guys accountable, they also hold the tenants accountable. And so if the tenant is living in the house and there's a plumbing leak and they decide not to mention it and six months down the road they call you up and say hey you know what I got a mold problem and oh yeah this thing's been leaking for the last six months but you know I never called you guess what they're on the hook for it um, and it, at least there's the law to keep them on the hook for it um, so they have obligations they have um, something they need to be held accountable to as well Usually that's not the problem. Usually it's it's uh, with an HVAC. They they want you out there right now, um, but it, it does happen. Okay. Are you guys doing move-in inspections? Yes. Okay. On your move-in inspections, do you talk about mold? Mm -hmm. You should. Okay. Landlord Tenant Act says that you have five days to well. In your move-in inspection, you should have some kind of verbiage that says the house is, there's no mold in the house, okay? The tenant then has five days to um, confirm that there's no mold in the house, okay? If after five days the tenant does not sign off 
and, and, and most property management companies I know are giving them a packet, there's a sheet specifically for mold, and they have to sign off on it and give it back within five days. If the tenant does not give that sheet back within five days, it's assumed under law that the house is mold free. Okay, that there's no mold issues in the house. That is a good starting point, and, and the reason I bring this up is because now, at the time of the lease, you can say, this, you didn't have any mold, you signed off on it, and now you didn't call us because the toilet is leaking, and now we have a mold problem. You can't tell me that it was like this back when you moved in because we have the documentation. So it's all about documenting and, and, and covering your liabilities. Now, if you do this, um, and you state that there is a mold problem and the tenant decides to still take occupancy, he, he can actually walk away at that point or he can take occupancy. Um, you now have some time requirements. And it's no later than five business days to start the process. Okay, So five days notification that he's got to get it back to you, five days to um, have somebody come in and start remediation. Not just come in and look at it, but actually start remediation. Let's talk about relocation. In a lot of cases, we can do remediation with tenants in place. In a situation that arises where I come in and say, hey, there's no possible way for us to do this with the tenant in place. Um, we need to find something for, some place for the tenant to go. The tenant is still fiscally responsible for the lease. You can't just say, hey, you know, I'm not paying you because you're moving me into a hotel. Um, however, if you put him into a hotel and it says like means, um, you are obligated to pay for the hotel. Because he's obligated to pay for your rent, you're obligated to pay for his, his hotel expenses. Um, and not to exceed 30 days. Um, I get to have remediation um, that succeed at 30 days. We do a lot of big remediations in, in a week's time. Um, now, that is for us to do come in and do remediation work. It does not include, we don't do reconstruction work. So I tell all of our clients we're going to leave you a clean dry hole, um, meaning that we're going to come in, get rid of all the mold, dry everything out, and there's a lot of drywall and trim companies that can come up, and I'm sure you guys have contacts for, for those type of companies to do reconstruction work. So you all don't handle any of the contracting on the back end? Is that like a conflict of interest? No, um, it's uh, Chad doesn't have enough time in his day. Um, to be completely honest, I mean, um, and, and, and I've kind of subscribed to this philosophy that Energizer makes great batteries right. and they don't do anything else. So why not be the great mold company and not do anything else? There's a thousand different drywall companies out there. I mean, there's, there's plenty of. The cost though. Absolutely. Competitively. Yeah. Um, and, and then here's the other side of this is that my guys make pretty good money doing what they do. Um, so now you're paying somebody who's a skilled mold remediation guy to come in and do drywall work, um, which would pay less. So you're paying more for my guys than what you would if you went out and hired somebody else. So it's more costly for you in, in the end. Um, and I, I really like to be able to specialize in exactly what we do. And I tell our people, you know, my guys are doing this 40, 50 hours of work week um, and, and doing nothing else. They're not doing drywall, they're, they're doing mold remediation all this time. Um, and so, and, and that's why we don't do, you know, some of the other like serve pros and service masters, they do fire and body trauma and meth lab and all these other different types of remediation. And we strictly stay with the mold and water. And, and it's just because they go hand in hand. Um, so kind of what I've already talked about, um, you're gonna do comparable dwelling units. Uh, if, if they're going to take occupancy and, and we have to move them out, you have to provide them comparable, um, whether it's a hotel uh, covering their expenses. Um, and in the tenant shell, continue the responsibility for the payment um, of, of the lease. Uh, um, sometimes, well, I can't say sometimes, I, I've had this happen more.
that point, there was that five-day clause where the owner had five days to take care of the issue. Right. And they just ended up letting them walk away from it. Um, and I think my question kind of escaped me there. <laughs> it, it happened, <laughs> it happened so fast. I mean, it was the day before that they were coming. Right. They did a walkthrough, and it was like, oh my gosh, you know, hardwood floors had just been replenished and all this stuff. Um, I guess, I, I guess my question would probably be answered once I, once I reread the, the lease again about five days because that's what my, the owners wanted to fight was that they had five days to remediate any issues. And that is. And, and, and that's what landlords tend to ask. Actually, it, it's five days to get started. It's not necessarily that you have five days right. to, to finish it, right. but five days to start that process. Right. Um, as to whether you let them out your lease. Um, I don't know. Well, we ended up getting that anyway, but um, but that was there was more of a question than I like I said, the brain space, so I'll, I'll remember it before you. Okay. <laughs> well, I have a question though. So we do the initial walkthrough. Um, we don't actually discuss them all, but we do give them five days to return the walkthrough, and there is a uh, an addendum we'll call it that says either check there is visible mold or check there is no visible mold. Um, and I had tenants that refused to sign it because there was caulking in the tub that was discolored. Mm -hmm. um, and my argument, and of course I didn't say to them, this is not mold, because I'm not a mold expert. Right. I don't want to step on toes, but um, in my mind it wasn't mold. I mean, I feel like there's sometimes those gray areas where, <coughs> would that be considered mold, or would that be considered just a dirty tub? It is, um, and, and okay. it's not some. It, it is mold. Okay. okay. Um, it's not mildew. Mildew is actually um, a parasite. It requires a living host. Uh, we see it on tropical plants. It's that white powdery stuff that grows on tropical plants. It's a parasite, totally different organism than what mold is. Um, however, we use the term mildew all the time because it's just a little bit cleaner of a word than mold. Everybody right. thinks mold is dirty and bad, and but let's call it what, what it is. And, and I have the same problem in, in our shower. You know, you get mold in the caulking, mold in the grout lines. Um, right. This is the one time where I'll tell you that bleach is okay. And I would say that bleach was very bad in, in the very beginning. But on um, solid surfaces, uh, non porous surfaces, tile, um, glass, ceramics. Um, the caulk? The, well, the caulk. Is it not porous? No, it, it's, it's not porous, but cut it out. I mean, just right. it'll take a handyman like two minutes to cut it out, wipe it down with a little bit of bleach or other cleaning solution, um, and then put new. You call them. Don't call me because I'll tell you, I'm, I'm, you don't want me to come out. I mean, I'm going to charge you $75 to come out and look at something, right. and I go, it's, yeah, just cut it out. And, you know, for $75, you can pay somebody to cut it out and, and re caulk it. Um, technically, yes, it's visible mold. Um, okay. Now, that being said, um, okay, so check it. Yes, we'll have, you know, Joe Blow's pain man servers come out and, and cut it out. Right. It's not something that's indicative of a large-scale mold problem that's going to impact indoor air quality. Right. Um, but technically, by the definition, yes, it would be considered mold and, and should be dealt with. Um, and I would have a hard time believing that any of the recommended agencies would have a problem with cutting it out and, and recalking it. Um, well, this one elected hand. to, he asked if he could do it himself because there were other repairs that he was going to do. Right. Um, but in the meanwhile, it made me a nervous wreck because I'm like, there you go, throwing around that N word. You know, like, hold on, pump your brakes. Right. Like you said, I wanted to call it discoloration, dirty tub. Um, but now I know. Okay. So it, going yeah. forward, I'll make sure my owner. And everybody everybody really gets you know, scared about, we the tub? about mold. And, and there's cases that rightfully so you, you should be. And, and, right. and like you were talking about with, with your client earlier, is that, you know, not that I have a nonchalant or cavalier attitude towards it, but. If we're dealing with something that's much smaller, and, 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 and in your case it was a small piece of trim, yeah. let's just pull the piece of trim out and go outside and, and our mold problem goes away, you know? And now just have a handyman come in and put a new piece of trim. Um, so there are times when we should absolutely go, hey, pump the brakes, we need to, you know, get this figured out. Right. But there's also times where, you know, a little bit of common sense says, hey, this is, you know, every, every shower tub is going to have a little bit of mold in it. I mean, it, it's just... I'm sure if everybody was honest in here and raised their hand, if you have it in yours, I mean, I it's, you know, it is not indicative that we're dirty people or that we have an unkept house. It's, you know, it, it's, it's soap scum on a wall and 
a high moisture area, mold spores are in the air, it's an ideal situation for mold growing, and so it does. And so in that case, cut it out, re it, and move on with them. Well, I'm gonna send an email to all the agents with all the information. So at what point, because I wanna include this, at what point do we call him? Should I call when I saw the, the tiny strip? I think anytime you have a tenant complaint okay. um, that says, now, if you want to go out and go first walk the property and, and see what that you know tenant complaint is, I think that's a great idea. And then say, okay, you know what, I, I'm going to call, we have a vendor that takes care of our mold remediation, let me call them, and we'll get them to come out and come out and take a look at it. Um, because then when you call in the office and, and you're talking to Don, you can say, hey, I went out and looked at it, and this whole wall is black, and you know that might get us out there a little bit quicker than... Uh, I went out and I looked at the bathtub and it had some caulk uh, that had discoloration in it, you know. Right. Um, so it, it triggers a little bit of a response, not not because we want to be picky and choosy about what we come out and look at, but we also want to make sure that we're not wasting your guys' time um, and that if you have a large-scale problem, we want to try to get to it as quickly as possible right. so that, you know, we can cover you guys as much as possible as well. So. Now, I guess when you go to the homes to assess it, does Every inspection require air testing, or is that just based on that common knowledge, that common sense? This is what it is. It doesn't need testing. This is how you can remediate it. And, and, and back to her situation, didn't do any testing. We walked in, it was a $75 inspection, um, and we took care of the problem while we were there because it wasn't worth sending somebody out to, to come out and take care of it later. Um, I had stuff on me, I just went in and took care of it. Now, if you walk in and, and we're dealing with somebody who has. Um, you know, they're complaining of mold symptoms and you know little Johnny has been sick he's been in the hospital five times and you know it's the mold this and the mold that I think that's a great opportunity um, to do mold testing um, I am NOT a big fan of hyper analyzing a situation if I walked in and the mold the, the, the walls covered with mold I'm gonna tell you the walls covered in mold and, and it needs to be remediated in that situation unless there's a situation where somebody wants to know exactly what type of vid mold it is so they can talk to their doctor or something like that um, usually I, I don't push I don't push mold testing um, if we walk in and go it looks like mold smells like mold it's mold um, I, from a from a remediation standpoint in, in writing our scopes of work we don't need to know what type of mold it is in order to uh, fix the problem we can come in and cut it out fix it and, and move on um, where I do push testing is when you have um, somebody who's sick um, or we have somebody with litigation. Um, those two situations, I'm gonna say, you need to test, you need to test, you need to test. Um, I didn't know if there were guidelines through the EPA or any of those other associations that required the testing. Mm -hmm. There's not. Um, and, and even in Landlord or Tenant Act, it doesn't require it. It just says that you need to use a, um, a company that's going to follow one of these standards, whether it's IRCRC, EPA, CDC, one of them. Um, they just want you to have somebody following those standards. Um, but even those standards don't require mold testing to, to do it's the remediation. It's more so those type of filters that you're using contained in the area. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other questions? Can I ask that? Oh, go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead. It was just. Um, you said $75 to come out? Mm -hmm. okay. And then that is also credited back. If we do the remediation, we credit that $75 back. Um, so $75, we come out, uh, we do moisture readings, uh, use thermal imaging cameras, and, and try to identify if it's a crawl space, we'll crawl through the crawl space, take pictures, you know, figure out what's going on, um, and try to figure out a, a plan of what needs to be done, a source. Um, and then um, with that, we'll include a, an estimate if, if there's remediation that's needed. Um, if we get into a situation where we need to do testing, testing is $75 per sample. Um, okay. And what you'll find is that if you call around to my competitors, they're normally in the $100 to $125 a sample. And is there a, a required amount of samples? <coughs> I do at least two if we're doing air sampling. Um, typically, we do a lot of three samples at a time. Um, so, and I can tell you, like right now, we have a special right now on Angie's list, and if you just call us, we, I mean, I give it away all the time. But it's um, it's two samples and an inspection for 195, so you take $30 That's off of that. Um, and if we need to do extra samples, then we'll just credit the extra sample, put the extra sample on the back of that. So, um, 
if you were to call industrial hygienists to come out, usually they're four to five hundred dollars to show up, um, and then a hundred, hundred and twenty-five a sample. Um, you know, my my goal in life is not just all your sampling. I, I really I want the remediation work, so that's why we keep our prices so low on the inspection side, is because hopefully you guys are happy with us, and we're going to do the remediation work as well. And I would assume that, I would assume that pricing for the remediation would depend on the area, how large of a scale. Yep. And, and one thing I will tell you, um, I never shoot for my hip, so if I come out and, and look at a property for you, and you go, hey, how much is this going to cost? I will never give you a price while I'm standing there, um, just because there's so many variables that play into it. And so we sit down in front of the computer and, and put it out on a, on, a, on a written format for you, and that way you know exactly what you're paying. Everything is line item pricing, so you see exactly what you're getting charged for each, whether it's a piece of equipment that needs to be used, that's you know an individual price. So you see exactly where everything goes financially. So. How many guys do you have in Guys or girls? Um, eight guys and one girl. I'm oh, sorry, eight girl guys, now. two girls. Um, <laughs> right? Eight and two? Yeah. And then uh, we're in the process of hiring at least two more. So. Um, what cities do you do? Uh, everything on the south side and Peninsula, we hit Newport News, uh, Hampton. Um, we'll go to Williamsburg. When we hit Williamsburg, um, our inspection fee goes to 95 just because of the travel time. Right. Same thing if we go to Suffolk, it goes to, to 95. Okay. Um, I try to stay out of Suffolk, but um, right. we will go to Suffolk. Okay. Oh, so <laughs> well, we Anybody live in Suffolk? Um, my broker does, actually. He's in Suffolk. There's not a lot of money in Suffolk. I've, I've yet to sell a job in Suffolk. Mm -hmm. And I've done a lot of inspections out there. I was getting ready to say, I could only imagine they need you. I mean, it, 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 it's like it's a very, big. very right. compact areas that have the money. I mean, they're a little old school out there, though. Mm -hmm. I've been in some rental properties where I'm like, you guys are living like this? This is okay? Yeah. You have a car in there? Like, we're cool with this? <laughs> okay, wow. Um, as, as far as the, the amount of remediations we do, um, I, Lincoln Military Housing, I was one of their industrial hygienists back in 11 and 12 when everything blew up with them. I'm sure you guys saw it in the news. No. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, they, they did millions this of dollars. <laughs> you don't remember that? No. Millions when they did the big expose on all the uh, mold in the military housing? No. Yeah, tons class action tons, suits. Yes. Wow. Um, I was one of the lead industrial that. hygienists that were coming out writing all the inspection reports. Um, and we're now their largest remediation contractor. We handle all of their, anything that involves command staff, attorneys, or anything that's gonna be in the newspaper, we're the only company that deals with it. Um, so you know, we're pretty good at what we do. Um, and like I said, my guys do it 40, 50 hours a week, and that's the only thing they do. Now, are you guys, do you, do you guys work on the weekends too? We do. Okay. Um, it's usually kind of try to get us caught back up Usually once we get to about the two week point where, you know, we're scheduling two weeks out and, and that's where we're at right now, um, people don't like waiting two weeks. And, and obviously in a, in a property management situation, um, we try to, to work with that as well. But um, usually once we get to that point where we're booking out two weeks and guys will start working more over time to get us caught back up and, and so we're not booking out two weeks. Right. Um, but property management, the. I try to cater to you guys because I realize that you, you're the ones that are in these units day in and day out and, and you have the ability to, to bring us, you know, multiple units as opposed to, you know, Harriet, our homeowner that owns one house and, you know, she has a small mold problem. We want to make sure you guys are, are taken care of and that your clients are taken care of. Uh, so we try to squeeze those in as, as much as possible. Well, we appreciate it. I know my client was happy, so. Yeah. Client and tenant. All right. Any other questions? No. All right. I wish we would have had more agents. That's okay. They just missed out on really good information. Yeah, well, they're going to get it. They're going to get it. <laughs> they, <laughs> it's especially hard. I mean, we, you know, Kilts <clears throat> is like the favorite thing for the Absolutely. contractors. They're like, well, we'll kilt it, paint it, we're good. No more. Well, I had um, an experience in Smithfield where the mold had, a, the house had been vacant for several years, and the mold was really bad. Well, we had, a, we had cut into the wall and found that it was all the way upstairs. Right. So I unfortunately learned the hard way. Well, and, and those are those are situations that we do as well. I mean, you know, that's why we charge seventy five dollars is because I think that we really, from an investigative standpoint, that's the part that I enjoy is is the investigate, trying to figure out 
why there's you know why this tenant's having a problem. If there is a mold problem, then where is it coming from? Where's the moisture source? You know, how can we fix this? Um, I, I really enjoy that side of it, um, and, and I think that's one of the areas that we excel in um, is going in. And the other side of that, I think that we're pretty good at is, is talking to tenants and, and, and calming that storm. Um, I mean, I, I do it day in and day out. I, 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 you know, so I, I think we've we've got.